watch a drama You say you wanna watch a comedy Well you can watch it with your mama Or you can watch it with your daddy You'll even sit and watch it with your middle schooler So you can come and talk around our water cooler We'll watch it all day and all night Couch potatoes unite Whoa, whoa Couch potatoes unite Whoa, whoa brand new episode of the podcast entitled Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point, which is based on a blog of the same name because it's just another animated level for us, okay? My name is Kylie and I love TV. If you feel the same, keep listening and or checking out our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, as you're bound to find some common ground or something you like. For Couch Potatoes Unite, we're all about the wonders and the unique long-form storytelling of the small screen. CPU, exclamation point, hopes you've been following releases of brand new episodes of the podcast on Wednesdays, as well as new blog entries on some Tuesdays, and as always, we have several more new episodes on the way. Because the panels and I live lives behind our podcast, the episodes are published once per week. Subscribe to the blog or the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher Radio, via Google Play, and now on Spotify to stay on top of brand new episodes. Episodes already published discuss a variety of shows around the water cooler, including, but not limited to, Fuller House, Westworld, The Good Place, Grace and Frankie, Supernatural, Arrested Development, Jane the Virgin, and The Arrowverse on the CW. We publish several episodes in our Looking Back series covering such diverse shows as Rain, Friends, Sense8, Battle Creek, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel. Plus, new episodes are in the works, including revisits for Doctor Who, Gotham, Game of Thrones, Stranger Things, iZombie, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Orange is the New Black, 13 Reasons Why, The Crown, American Horror Story, and the Marvel's Defenders panel will talk Season 2 of The Punisher. We'll be launching new panels covering Riverdale, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, Altered Carbon, Mr. Robot, Charmed, Outlander, and The Breaking Bad Universe. And because we look back at shows now past, we'll take a smallish look back at a short-term show from some kind of yesteryear, namely freaks and geeks. We'll don witch hats and bring our Salem cats for Sabrina the Teenage Witch. We'll put out some musical stops for our crazy ex-girlfriend and we'll revisit one of the all-time and most watched classic sitcoms, MASH. By the way, did you know that CPU also from time to time goes live? We've been live from bunkers and comedy shows and comic cons, and we just went live from Blue Bridge Games to take a shiny look back at Firefly. Plus, we're planning more live appearances, not a cool stuff. It's true. So make sure you like or follow us at our Facebook page, our Twitter at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, or subscribe to the blog, our YouTube channel, our iTunes channel, our Stitcher Radio channel, or find us on Google Play as well as on Spotify. In the meantime, if you don't hear your show in this podcast format, fellow parents, and I still write reviews and we always seek new panelists. So if you have any interest in joining the discussion, say hello by finding us at any of those outlets I've mentioned. At the very least, stop by and leave us a thumbs up, comment, or review. We like feedback. Just keep your phasers and photon torpedoes to yourselves, if you would. Today's panel and I are continuing a new Looking Back series, the biggest Looking Back series we've ever launched, by request of one of our panel members and our second most involved panelist, by a hair, who made such an impassioned speech about the series of series at one of our our live Comic-Con events, we were moved to embark upon the now continuing mission of galactic proportions. If you aren't already aware from time to time, CPU chooses shows of all types, but usually of some fame or notoriety to reminisce about, and to consider whether or not they age gracefully, like a Vulcan deeply committed to the pursuit of logic and science, or don't hold up as well, like a doctor who's not anything but a doctor, such as babysitter, an engineer, etc. As such, this is another chapter of our Looking Back podcast episodes, where we review a show that has been gone, either by a natural end or cancellation, for some time. And this is but one chapter in a 30-episode or more series in which we will explore each individual season of a science fiction universe that comes back without never completely going away, and cycles that have recurred for more than 50 years. Today, we offer you episode four of this mega series, which will cover the entire Star Trek franchise. In today's fourth episode, we'll be discussing both seasons of the animated series. And we're talking about both together because the second season and is only six episodes, and frankly, to do otherwise would just be silly. Each new episode in this new CPU podcast franchise will progress through subsequent seasons of all the Star Trek TV series with additional coverage of the films. Furthermore, our panel will be rotating moderation duties. However, your friendly neighborhood chief couch potato and captain of the Starship CPU is not ready to give away the helm just yet. I am moderating today's discussion. 
Also, at various points in this mega series, we'll present top 10 best and bottom 10 worst episode lists around various themes chosen by the moderator in question, as we tend to do with our retrospective series. Although today will be more of a top five in each category, because there are only 22 episodes to begin with. We can't get started without a tiny bit of plot summary, though, so here we go. Star Trek The Animated Series is an American animated science fiction television series created by Gene Roddenberry. It originally aired from September 8, 1973 to October 12, 1974 on NBC, spanning 22 episodes over two seasons. The second series in the Star Trek franchise, it is the first sequel to Star Trek the original series. Set in the 23rd century, when Earth is part of a united federation of planets, it follows the adventures of the Starfleet vessel USS Enterprise as it explores the Milky Way galaxy. After the cancellation of the original series in 1969, the live-action show proved popular in syndication and generated significant fan enthusiasm. This resulted in Roddenberry's decision to continue the series in animated form. Much of the original cast returned to provide voiceovers for their characters. Show writers David Gerald and DC Fontana characterized the animated series as effectively being a fourth season of the original series. The animated series was critically acclaimed and was the first Star Trek series to win an Emmy Award when its second season won the 1975 Emmy for Outstanding Entertainment Children's Series. Throughout both seasons, Star Trek the Animated Series faced the reverse situation of the original series with regard to its popularity. Ratings were high, but skewed away from the young children, which Saturday morning advertisers were trying to reach, being more popular with adults and older children. Star Trek the Animated Series was named the 96th best animated series by IGN. They declared that although the series suffered from technical limitations, its format allowed the writers for greater freedom and creativity than was possible in the original live action series. Today in part four of our many, many multi-part Star Trek series, our modestly sized crew of Enterprise faithful and Trekkers extraordinaire, namely Nick, Sarah, Kyle, and Michael, along with your very involved moderator, will talk about the finer and less fine points of the animated series. It should be noted that all of our panelists have viewed the entire animated series and may discuss sensitive plot points, so for those of you who have not watched Star Trek, first of all, we'd be happy to beam you aboard, and second, if you plan to do so, listen at your own risk, as there may be major Spoilers! Welcome back, panel! How are you? Awesome! Great. I'm doing good. Ready to talk about Star Trek, the animated series? Of yeah, course. Yep. Yep. Okay. So if you've been following the series, we've already covered the first three seasons of the original series, and we are doing a retrospective, but this is a new series. So what I'm going to have you do now is to go back through the standard CPU character question that changes with each show we do for the animated series... So you can re-pick your character regarding how you feel about the animated series. So you have to do the business where you tell us who you are and how you came to watch the animated series, etc. And then you're going to do your character questions. Sound good? Yeah. yeah. I'm on it. Cool. How would you rate your interest in the animated series? You don't have to do beginning and end because it's really only 22 episodes. But just tell us how you feel about the animated series as a whole. Here is how the character question goes. Captain's Log. Stardate 6022019. The Enterprise is the best ship in the galaxy with the best crew and the best set of captains and commanders this side of science fiction. You only have eyes for the Enterprise and for Star Trek, for after all, there is no such thing as the unknown, only things temporarily hidden and temporarily not understood like Captain James Tiberius Kirk. At times, the animated series can be completely illogical. For the most part, however, you find Star Trek intelligent and its characters, including its captains and commanders, <coughs> compelling. Though you would never betray such emotional sentiments, you can't imagine a life without it. Live long and prosper, like Lieutenant Commander Spock. You're a doctor, not a TV critic, for crying out loud. You enjoy the characters, but some of the situations in which they find themselves are almost too unbelievable for words. Still, you don't think watching Star Trek is a waste of your precious time, or you watch it because your friends watch it, like Dr. Slash Ship Surgeon Lieutenant Commander Leonard Bones McCoy. Hailing frequencies open, Captain. What you like about Star Trek is that it presented a world that promoted equality and diversity for all races and genders and alien species, even if some of the stories occasionally struck you as silly or nonsense, like Lieutenant Niota Uhura, the head warp vector one, Captain. 
You don't know how you feel about the animated series or cast. In some ways it was ahead of its time, in other ways it was painfully low budget and dull. But you do like the idea of piloting a ship devoted to exploring the stars. Oh my, like Lieutenant Ikara Sulu. Or, you're giving her all she's got, Captain! Look, she's a fine ship, and you're happy that the saga lives on, but you just don't see what all the fuss is about above decks, no matter how hard you try to like it. Like Lieutenant Commander Montgomery or Scotty Scott. Who would like to start? I'm Nick. Hi, Nick. And I started watching the animated series technically several years ago when it was on Netflix, and I had finally gotten Netflix, and I watched an episode, and it didn't really hold my attention, and the world of Netflix was vast at that time, so I just never came back to it, and I really didn't actually watch it until we started getting ready for these panels. So I only watched it one time through. I ended up enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would, based on that, fir that first episode, which even that episode I liked a lot too, now that I've watched it. I, I don't know what was going on that first time, so I... I feel like this gives you some a little bit more payoff with characters that the series, the original series, didn't do, especially Aura and even some of Chapel, that I really enjoyed. I think I would the Spock description fit really well, cause there are moments that are absurd. <laughs> like I mean, Lincoln floating in space, absurd. So, but they can commit to it more. So sometimes I really liked it that it went this really science fiction-y way, and sometimes it was way too flying Aztec god in the sky weird for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I answered all your questions. You did! Yay, I'm done. A good job! Welcome <laughs> back, Nick! Thanks! I'm Kyle. Hi, Kyle. And I came to the animated Star Trek because I grew up as a huge fan of the original series, and I've said it before, like, Kirk is my captain. This is the flagship Star Trek that I grew up with. This is my series. I mean, and so as a completionist, I had to track down VHSs of the animated series. It was really hard to find growing up, like, probably, like, 1990. I was probably, like, five or six when I was really obsessed. So my dad would pick up VHSs at flea markets or wherever he could, and we'd track down eventually most of the episodes. But at the time, even then, as a kid, I... It was kind of boring to me compared to the show. The show was a lot more dynamic. I just couldn't get into the episodes, but I just needed to have them. So I would say, based on the description, I'm McCoy, because I absolutely love these characters, but just some of the crazy stuff that's going on in this show is just so out there, it loses me. Welcome back, Kyle. Kyle, do you want to touch on a dynamic? The moderator is my sister-in-law. I am married to her sister, Hillary, who co-podcasts with us on a lot of these. She's just not quite as big of a Star Trek fan. Correct. Welcome back, Kyle. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name's Michael. Hi, Michael. I grew... Let's see, what did I... Okay, so the animated series. I can remember watching the animated series when I was like six or seven years old on Nickelodeon. Because back in the late 80s, Nickelodeon was basically like an offshoot of like... Well, kind of like an offshoot of MTV, but also like these... It was just like a free-for-all television wise it's like what can we possibly add onto this children's network that will appeal to children but also the adults so there was this block in like the mid afternoon early evening of cartoons and stuff that was good for kids but also for their parents so it was like star trek the animated series Monkeys. I can remember watching the Monkeys series on Nickelodeon back in the late 80s, early 90s. And there's a bunch of other stuff that I remember watching. All the cheap filmation shows. Well, yeah, basically. Yeah. It was a lot of cheap, you know, animation that they could find really easily. So I can remember watching this before I ever really got into the original series. Like, this was almost kind of my real introduction into the show. This and, like, Star Trek IV were, like, the two big things. And then I later started watching this, the original series more religiously, like in my preteen years. So that's how I got into the animated series. I started out at a very young age, and it was kind of like one of my first entry points. As for how I identify character-wise, I'm going to do the cop-out thing where I do a combination of two characters, where I'm mostly Spock. Only Sarah will judge you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, and, and she's got the look in her face right now as she's staring through the computer screen. Yes, I am mostly Spock, where I love the characters, and I think the 
intellect of this particular version of the series is actually quite interesting. But I'm kind of like Sulu in the sense that there's some really out there silly ridiculous stuff that just is like, whoa, I'm just happy to pilot through this. So it's kind of a mostly Spock, a little bit of Sulu. Welcome back, Michael. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Hi. How are you guys? <laughs> Great. We're good. How are you? <laughs> I've been better, but I'm here. Okay. <laughs> I'm pulling up the thing because I didn't hear the recap because I had a child with me. There we go. Who was I before? I believe you were Bones. I think I was Bones, too. Well, What's your I started, name first? I don't have one. You don't have a name? Hi, Sarah. Hi. And I'm calling in remotely tonight because I'm home with a sick child. You might hear him from time to time. It's Jack, the junior podcaster, in yes. the background. How? Oh, how did I come to start watching the animated series? Oh, I had no intention of ever watching the animated series. <laughs> but a former student of mine, Isaac, who might be listening with Hi, his Isaac. mom, Lisa. Hi, yeah. Isaac and Lisa. And Lisa. They gave it to me as a gift when Isaac graduated because they knew it was the only one that I had not seen. And so they gave it to me. And so I started watching it. And actually, I really enjoy it. I think that, yeah, I think I'm still going to be Bones. And then would you like to do the dynamic or do you want to pass that off? I am married to Nicholas who is there, live and in person. Thanks and for watching our kid. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I should point out, he did volunteer to stay home, but he, but I was like, no, that's okay. I don't I'm fine. <laughs> welcome back, Sarah, and welcome back to a junior podcaster, Jack. Thank you. He's watching his own program now instead of sleeping. What's he watching? <laughs> Mother Goose Club. <laughs> <laughs> An excellent choice. <laughs> uh -huh. And of course, my name is Kylie, and I also had very little intention of watching the animated series, <laughs> but when Netflix came around to having all of the series, I tried to watch the animated series on my own one time, and much the same way that Nick kind of talked about it, I could not get into it. It was real real clunky at first so I kind of dropped it and never returned until we were preparing to get <laughs> <laughs> this podcast panel going and then I knew I had to watch the whole thing so I did. I would be Bones in this case. I was Spock for the original series. I would be Bones for this one. I think that some of it is too unbelievable for words because it's real silly at times, but I don't think watching it was a waste of my precious time, and plus my friends watch it, you know, that sort of thing. And also, I just really love Bones. He's one of my all-time favorite characters. I just love him so much. I relate to him a lot, so why, why don't I be Bones? There you go. There you go. No Bones about it. No Bones about it. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're talking about the animated series. If you've listened to the other episodes in this series, you know that what we kind of talk through is sort of our general impressions about the show. We're going to cover some of the things, some of the episodes we liked more and some of the episodes we liked less. And then we'll go through a definitive ranking. And we only are doing five because there's only so much you can get out of 22 episodes. So what do you want to start with? How did you feel about the animated series? I guess one thing I wanted to add that wasn't really relevant to our character introduction, this is what I thought when I first saw that it was available on Netflix like about five years ago. I was just scrolling through and I just saw it there. It's like my face lit up and I was like, oh my goodness, the animated series, I haven't seen that in literally 20 years. So I started watching it and I was like, oh man, I remember this or I remember that. And I didn't get through many episodes when I rediscovered it on Netflix, but I just remember that feeling of nostalgia that I don't get from watching the original series. So for me, the animated series as a whole just has a more, that weird feeling of nostalgia and that weird conglomeration of happiness for seeing it again, but also longing for that simpler yeah. time. Like, like Saturday that personal morning. connection. Yeah, that. the Saturday morning cartoons, watching it on Nickelodeon. You know, just, I don't know. I just think that this series has a different feel in that nostalgia factor 
the original series feels timeless in some way, but this is so rooted in the 70s, and especially 70s animation, <laughs> that there is that nostalgia factor that I feel like doesn't really apply to the original series in some way. And I don't know if that's just the way anyone else feels. Well, not for me, because I didn't watch it when I was a well, right. kid. Right. I didn't start getting into Star Trek until the next generation came along. So, And I certainly didn't try to find the animated series while right. I was through going through those series. So I don't have that nostalgia factor. Like, I really had to commit to this. <laughs> so I guess that's my interesting, yeah. what I find, my question, if, if I were to ask a question, would be, where is... Where's the? There's got to be a debate here between the nostalgia factor that I have, and plus the uh, the drudgery of it that half, almost half, more than half the panelists are feeling right now. See, for me, I don't have any nostalgia because, like, I'm I'm kind of cynical. Like, I know that they only made this show to sell toys. That is true. Which Kylie yes. touched on it. Like, mm. Amigo bought the rights to make toys for it, and it's cheaper to make 22 episodes than to make commercials. Mm -hmm. So they commissioned it the cheapest company they could, Filmation. But they kind of trick the cast and the writers into thinking that, oh, this is more than what it is when essentially it's 22 episodes to sell toys. And so I'm kind of cynical. Like, I, I feel kind of jaded, especially when you read a lot of the cast accounts of it. Like, they were really excited for this, and they mm -hmm. thought it was going to, like, really be the resurgence in Star Trek. And they were just kind of being hoodwinked. And meanwhile, these toys, like, they're selling their likeness, they're not getting any rights. But in that regard, the show is so much better than it really had any right to be, mm -hmm. because... The original Star Trek writers happened to be so cheap. The cast at that point was willing to negotiate for no, no royalties and just like pretty much bare minimum. So there are some really great episodes, more than there could have been. I mean, they were really, it could have been so much worse than it turned out. So I, I have really mixed feelings on the animated series. There's, there's some episodes I really love, but yeah, it gets so weird and out there. <laughs> there are some great sci-fi concepts they explore that there's a couple episodes that I feel like they then were like, well, when we're making Next Gen or Deep Space Nine or Voyager even, that they pulled from and even explored even more. The other thing I'll say, one of my critiques of the original series is sometimes it, the 50 minutes, it seemed like it kind of dragged on. And we remember talking about not having a B story to cut to. This, the 22 minute thing, like they move it along in a way that didn't seem too fast, but even the ones that were really bizarre 22 minutes is nothing. Yeah. Like, you're, 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 already, you're already launching into the next episode. Right. And then, even though it wasn't great animation, you actually felt like you were more in this futuristic... It didn't look... It wasn't a bunch of humans around. They didn't have to worry about the budget. Mm -hmm. So, like, you have a crew member in every episode that is very different looking. I forget his name. Ix or Rix or... I don't oh, know. yeah. The, the alien. The oh, cat. Yes. Yeah, the Maras. cat. I like Maras the cat. Maras isn't uh -huh. as many as the one who basically... Eryx. Eryx, who me. replaced mm -hmm. Chekhov, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you get... I was voiced by James Doohan. Yes, mm -hmm. James Doohan. Unless... <laughs> unless it was a main character he or a woman. Much everybody. It was James Doohan. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. And every time a female character came on screen, Sarah and I would be like, is that Michelle or Majel? <laughs> It's one or the other. And it doesn't take long to figure out which one, but it was always one of them, too. It was, I don't know if they had they ever had a... No, they were a couple guests. There were a couple original guests. Yeah, they were a couple. Didn't Ted Knight do a voice in this show? I don't know. There's a couple of somewhat famous there's a couple people of, that There's did. a couple of, yeah. And even the, whoever reprised Mud. Just jumping off of what you're both saying about, you know, the cast, do you know the tidbit about why... Nichelle Nichols and James Doohan are actually on the series. No. I'll take that as a no. Okay, so... <laughs> Michael's very excited. So, I was reading up on the show because I done. I didn't realize how deep the show went. Kind of jumping off from what you were saying about how the cast was hoodwinked. Originally, they didn't want anyone other than DeForest Spot. Kelly, William Shatner, and Leonard Nimoy. They just wanted those three, and then they were just do the other voices as like scale actors exactly like. stock voice actors but it was leonard nimoy who stumped for nichelle nichols and Hi Saluder. george takai and and james Doohan. he said no we need them because you are literally taking out the only people of color on this series <laughs> if you just hire us three. The whole point of this show is diversity and bringing everyone together in the 23rd century. And if you leave out the only people and the only women 
<laughs> the only people of color and the only women, you are doing a disservice to the entire series. And it was Leonard Nimoy that said, we will not do this show unless you hire those three. And so they were forced to do so. And part of the reason the show, it looks so cheap is because they had to, you know, basically double the salaries of their worker budget, basically, or their cast budget. So they had to find ways to cut corners. And that's a lot of the reason, not just because it's You'll see a lot of the same, always cutting corners, the same animated but... character in the background of like a bunch of different episodes. Right. The silhouettes. <laughs> There's a reason why they would always do far shots with silhouettes. It's because, hey, you don't have to color in all of the details on the characters if you just do a black silhouette. And also, Leonard Nimoy loved everybody so much. Like He felt bad that they didn't include Walter Koenig. Right. So he convinced mm -hmm. them to buy scripts from him for some of the episodes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know the Vulcan. Oh, is it just one that yeah. they used? Mm -hmm. But the Vulcan incident, I think, is... Didn't know that. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I just think that's part of. I mean, well, yes. it just goes to show you, like, not just a crew, but as a cast, like, they're like family and mm -hmm. looking out for each other. And that's part of the reason why people love the show so much because the people that made it were passionate about it. And it's, I believe it's DC Fontana. And what was the other writer you mentioned that was on board? For the series I at the beginning. Oh, I did. I mentioned DC Fontana a little bit, but okay, no, well, he's I, right. There was it two was writers. In the introduction. Yeah. David Gerald. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's those two that consider season four to be canon. It, Gene Ronberry is the one that's kind of like, who cares? This yeah. is just a cash grab. Yeah. But, it's, yeah, there, I, but it's since been reinstituted as true. canon. Actually, is, there's and a couple of Michael things, and Denise Okuda in the revised canon. Yesteryear is the only one that's canon. They decanonized right. every single episode except for Yesteryear. I think because they've it was, gone back on that. They've gone I back. Just read, there is some there, debate. Yeah. There's some debate. Because I mean, it's it, even on the Wikipedia. I mean, Wikipedia is not exactly, but for the animated series and. Because there's a whole, I mean, this thing has gone back and forth with Paramount and CBS. And in the last update, it was yesteryear is canon. Everything else is big question mark. Well, I think they've gone back to it being canon for two reasons. One, as Nick mentioned, there are several seeds that play out later in some of the sequel and mm -hmm. spinoffs. Right. Number two, the animated series is actually leaving Netflix as of December 1st. And the rumor is that CBS is going to take all the series. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Yeah. And so they're, they're thinking of it in terms of even though some of it's out there and it's not necessarily cohesively Star Trek because of these things you're talking about, there are still several episodes that either because they sequelized off the original series or in the case of yesteryear are critically acclaimed, plus it did win awards that the original series didn't win, mm -hmm. they have swung back a little bit. They may still mm -hmm. not like it or regard it as worse than the first three, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think the biggest thing that they were saying they didn't want it to be canon is the giant Spock still existing in the galaxy. Well, that is a terrible <laughs> then that's what they said. And so they're like, they're like, it's hard to accept any of it is canon if you accept that there's a Godzilla-sized Spock out there. <laughs> so much of this series, like, they take wild swings, and it's 50-50 it's for me if I'm like, I want to see this play out. And because it's animated, you can buy into it more, and it's less cheesy than something styrofoam or something that you've already seen in another episode being repurposed. And then other times it's like, I can't. I just can't get on board. Sometimes the episodes, and we'll talk about <coughs> some of these, no matter even if it was the cast, didn't feel like a Star Trek episode. Yeah because of like the one where the devil was in a different dimension or i don't know yeah what? space devil Lucian, yeah i think space it's called. devil that one I, I at first i was along for the ride but then it got so weird that i was like this doesn't feel like star trek I mean, that's how I, <laughs> see that's how i felt with like the mud episode with the love crystals I yeah just like... but his his voice left continuity for me so i was like i don't like this as much as the other ones but I, I didn't have that feeling with it. But I get why you feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> I think a good example of an episode that was right on the line for me of something like, they could not have pulled this off in the, in the original series. Right. It'd be mm -hmm. difficult to pull off in even a modern one. Now with CGI, it would be a little easier. But then it was still almost too bizarre to watch. It's them. With the char the colony character, the colony yeah. species. Like, that's pretty original sci-fi. Like, right. And mm -hmm. that was enjoyable to an extent to at least think about, then the episode was, was not one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The episode was like, we are just going to make this a big ball of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, is that the guy that could like 
go into different like his body parts. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. like my most hated episode. His legs would I couldn't away. even rewatch like. That's on my bottom list. Yeah, that's sure. like <laughs> it was close on my bottom list. It it did not make my bottom five just because having a colony creatures, I think, is what they called it. I haven't seen anything like that in like you know. There's like symbiotes and mm-hmm. the symbiosis, but I don't know. I liked that concept. Not and that is that, that and that episode as bad as it is though, <laughs> it does lead credence to the fact that it's canon because it's the first episode where they call him James Tiberius Kirk. Oh, exactly. Oh, that's the first. Mm-hmm. Time yeah, that's the that. first that's Tiberius. Two of this, too. Yeah. Yeah, he's never Tiberius. So it goes Tiberius to show you though, even like at its Tiberius. lowest, it was there still. there is some stuff that like it's stick, it's stuck. And yeah, something I will admit that even though the show has the nostalgia factor for me and watching it made me feel somewhat like a kid again. I will admit, watching it for this podcast, and this is the first time I had watched all 22 episodes, there were moments, like there were episodes where I literally fell asleep. And when I was going back through the episodes to create my top five and bottom five, anytime there was an episode that I know I fell asleep for and I don't remember anything about the episode, I'm like, oh, Gosh, that must have been one of the ones I fell asleep for. That's probably close to my bottom five right there. <laughs> I that liked one it. Of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's, that's your, your feelings are valid. Yeah. Continue. I think, well, I just think maybe I had really, really low expectations. So I was like, oh, this is really enjoyable. I like this. I really liked, like, the one where Spock had to go back in time and, like, Yesteryear. Yesteryear. Yeah, I mean, that's my favorite. That's the best episode. Like, yeah. And it's clearly and the best. if you, I mean, scenes my from least the, no, the skinny. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, the see pretty much all the scenes no, of Young like, Spock and the new Star in Star Trek 2009, the Kelvin timeline, are almost exactly from this episode. Mm-hmm. And this was DC Fontana's episode, so I mean, it is very much the most Star Trek, and it's it's an important viewing for Spock. I will say the next time, and it'll, it'll be a while, but the next time I watch the original series, I most likely will also watch this. It's not, I mean, twenty two episodes isn't that much of a twenty minute show, and I think the positive moments outweigh the negative. Sarah, I feel like you had more to say about the show in general. Oh, thank you, Michael. I guess I don't. I just enjoyed it. I don't know. I mean, I didn't find it as, like, deep. I didn't think any of the themes were, like, as deep. I mean, like you said, it's kind of a commercial for toys. But I liked it, and I thought that they were able to have some more alien diversity, I guess, on the bridge. That was cool. That's it. (laughs) I give it two thumbs up. I mean, I'm not going to sit around watching it, like, every year, but I enjoyed my viewing experience. So. Yeah, I I mean, just to echo, there there are ones that are good and that held my attention, but there are ones that are not. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that did not hold my attention. And I was checking my phone or getting up to get snacks or trying not to fall asleep. And so, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the mercy was that it was 22 minutes long, so it, none of them lasted that long. Yes. But So at, whenever an original series felt like, oh, I'm not really enjoying this episode, but we have to get through because we're going to record about season three soon, mm-hmm. That those episodes then felt like they were three hours long. Yeah, sure. Whereas this was like, okay, it's done. Okay. It's done, yeah. <laughs> and like somebody else mentioned, there were some good episodes for the side characters. I think yes. the Lorelei, I can't remember the Lorelei full title. Lorelei Lorelei yeah. Yeah. You get to see no, Uhura no, take control of the ship. and Yeah, you get to see Uhura save everybody, which you never would have seen in the original series. They just couldn't no. do it. NBC wouldn't allow it. Exactly. Them. And then there's the other episode with Sulu where it's like all Sulu with the plants. And those episodes are great because I love those characters. And on the original show, you just didn't get to see as much of them as you would have liked. That's true. Yeah. Did anybody miss Chekhov, or were we good without him? I, I mean, I'm, I, was, I, I was good without him. Yeah. So like, I didn't miss him because he's my least favorite character. Yeah, I mean, as much as I love the original series, I just don't see that he adds that much to it. No. I really, like, my enjoyment of the Chekhov character isn't until some of the movies. And I was going to say, yeah, even in Anton, some of the movies, he's separate yeah. from the rest of them. But, like, I loved seeing he's him in Generations. He's the Voyage Home. <laughs> yeah, he, those I mean, he he ran movies. right off the side of a battleship. Right. <laughs> like, I pretty much said that it like sums up the character. I think in the he orig- is a monkey. <laughs> well, that kind of bridges into what I was gonna say. On the original series, he was basically the mop top idol that the teen girls could fall in yeah. love with. And, and that was obvious in the third season. Yeah, oh boy. yeah. And so we all know that Walter's kind of prickly in real life. So I've never really had. 
too much of an affinity for that character just in general, yeah. even though it was novel at the time because we were in the middle of the Cold War and he was Russian and blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. But at the same time, watching the animated series, I didn't feel a hole in my heart without yeah. Chekhov. I might have already said this, but when Futurama did the Star Trek episode and they brought all the cast that was alive except for Jimmy Doohan, yeah. Chekhov counted everybody's lines and was like, I have one less than everyone else. So <laughs> the writer gave him an extra speech. Hashtag and- diva! <laughs> <laughs> Walter, if you're listening, you know it's true. <laughs> Do we want to talk about the new characters that are introduced in this series? If you want, Michael. I think we should. Okay. <laughs> because I think it's cool that because of the animated genre, yes, I did right. say it that way, like <laughs> Alex Trebek. <laughs> You're Canadian now? <laughs> Maybe I am. I feel like it's really important that this animated series delved more into the alienness of the aliens that are on it like Nick is saying about the colony species, but there was also the plant species that had more tentacles and no face features. Eryx and Moresk. I mean, you may not realize it, but Eryx has like six appendages, four <laughs> legs and two arms. Wasn't really made a big deal, but of course... <laughs> you couldn't see it very often. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, he was sitting at a concert. <laughs> and Moresk was a cat creature, so I mean, that would have been Who had a huge weird sort budget. of vocal tank. Right. <laughs> I wonder if she's related to that dancing cat woman oh, from, from five. Is it, yeah, the fifth yep. one. <laughs> Final frontier. You never know. Yeah. Oh. I don't know. I mean, I thought they were interesting. <laughs> Why no, does God not. need a <laughs> <laughs> I would still rate that higher than the animated series. The fifth oh my movie. God. Oh my god. Them's fighting words. Oh my. <laughs> I can't wait till we no. make everything. I mean, have you ever seen the scenes of them around the campfire? Like, that is pure character Okay, that's moments. a great scene. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's I mean, all the character scene. moments in that movie are great. There's that some good stuff in that movie. Terrible. There is good stuff in that movie. <laughs> that scene There's in that sequence There's good stuff in the animated good. series, Kyle. <laughs> we would have to do like a scale balancing of that because i just don't think i can subscribe to this position <laughs> i'm being oppressed <laughs> you have right to your feelings your feelings are valid that's what Sarah there says. you go <laughs> i do say that that's true this isn't canon but i do think it's interesting that there is a book series i don't know if anyone out there that's a trekkie has read the new frontier series of books written by Peter David. They work out in the early aughts, I believe, late 90s, early aughts they were. And Some people say it that way, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not a, you're not the... The 1900s? <laughs> no, no, not the... <laughs> people call the, or I can't say 2000s, it just feels weird, so I say aughts. <laughs> I can say the noughts, that's what some people say, but... You ought not to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> early Grandpa 2000s. You had to say Diggity because the guys are still the worst. He just called you Abe Simpson. <laughs> I'm okay with that. So, in the New Frontier series, <laughs> author Peter David did in fact take those two characters and use them in a rather important plot point of them being a part of the New Frontier canon. They actually were like brought back from the past into the present day because the New Frontier book series takes place around the contemporaneous era of the next generation. So they actually brought those characters to the present day and became part of the New Frontier crew. So I mean, I don't know if anyone's ever read Peter David's work, but he always liked to bring everything together in his work, and I always thought he was the greatest author of Star Trek books. But hey, we're not really talking about that. Did you not read not Shatner's canon. books? <laughs> Are you the best? Being serious? I'm now? being serious. <laughs> they brought Captain Kirk back from the dead. He loves Captain Kirk. Have you not followed? Yeah, this I know. I'm, not, I'm so still. They had sure Captain Kirk serious. fight the Borg. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> I'm still not sure he's being serious. <laughs> I mean, my brother read the Captain Cook bo- or Kirk books. The Captain, Captain Cook book, all right. Kirk books. It's they should make Kirk that. Because Kirk book sounds like Cook book, but anyway. I know. I'm just teasing you, Michael. <laughs> hey, I have problems with being articulate, as probably people have noticed. But anyway, it's okay. You're fine. Keep I think going. your singing is worse in your head than <laughs> it probably is. Yeah. Anyway, yes. I mean, 
I haven't read the Captain Kirk book, so I would not know what that's like. I but suppose. even just talking about this as it relates to the animated series, like it goes to show you the different Star Trek fans, how much we we're all different. Right. Like that's true. <laughs> what I value versus like Kylie Next Gen, like it's all valid though. It's all the same umbrella. Like I'm not a big fan of cartoons, so I always rank this show lower. But that doesn't it, it doesn't mean that it's worse than any of these. It's just personal preference. And it goes all the Star Trek series are like this for everybody. I mean, it's like a dartboard. You don't know with each person. Which isn't to say that I don't love the characters, because I do. Mm -hmm. I still love the characters as much as their original series portrayals. Sure. Mm -hmm. Especially Spock, especially Bones, but all all three of the main guys. And then I even like the fact that Uhura and Scotty and Sulu get more, as Kyle was saying, to do despite the fact that you're talking about 22 episodes and 22 minutes per episode. Right. But it's it's more the storylines. I think Nick is right. They took risks. Some of them worked and some of them didn't. Mm -hmm. And the ones that didn't really didn't. Right. <laughs> so it's just, for me, it's not even the personal preference of because it's animated or whatever. It's it's that it was very clunky. Mm -hmm. It was probably haphazardly thrown together in some instances because if we're talking about it being I mean, basic, filmation, it was rushed. I right. Mean, they could, they, I mean, they just rushed these episodes. Assembly right line after. Yeah, Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's hard to, it's hard to, for me, it's a quality aspect. It's right. It's less about the characters. It's less about the concepts. I really don't know how many frames per second they use because it is... Very few. Minimal. Yeah. Standard it's almost animation. like it might as well be in a comic book yeah. or a comic strip. Is it standard animation <laughs> like that around twelve? I don't. Because twenty four is twenty four is the standard for most movies and TV shows of. Well, I mean, not anymore because of digital and what have you. But I believe most animated shows. I can't remember the exact number, but it is smaller than 24. There's an awful lot of stock shots of character yes. in foreground, <laughs> character just in background, and only the mouth moving. And lots of, and lots of close-ups, <laughs> yeah. yes. And silhouettes. As or they'll take a shot yeah. of them walking one way and then just reverse it right. for another episode <laughs> if they needed them to walk another way. And the running's real good. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about that Scooby running. Scooby-Doo Scooby -Doo style. <laughs> <laughs> like, Scooby-Doo was better. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. Did you all, like me, when you were binge-watching it, like you could tell when you were supposed to be super excited because they played the same musical cues uh, yes. in every episode? I Bam! I ended up liking the the music it was maybe because it was repetitive it like right, just yeah. ingrained itself into my brain it was brain. a comforting thing to you <laughs> but it, <laughs> yeah i was like huh i wonder if i could get that as a ringtone <laughs> <laughs> that i would totally love the bam as a ringtone not just not that's so not the bam. though it, it, it actually it reminded was. me of batman 66 with oh, like yeah. the pow yeah, bam right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't surprise me if it was like a soundbite that pre-recorded from one of those shows. Oh, like, okay. it was dirt cheap. <laughs> <laughs> there was something like a da 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 Right, yeah. That kind of sound. Yeah, I, I don't know. That was, was always the chase music. Or oh, the yeah. alien ship arriving. It was everything. It was mm -hmm. the same, the same stuff. It is funny you bring up the whole 70s thing, because this show is very... 70s. It feels very 70s. Yeah, it's definitely of its time, which is part of why the nostalgia factor comes into it for me, is because there is a certain timelessness to the original series that I don't feel... I mean, yes, there's elements that are very 60s, especially in the third season, but... Especially that hippie show. Right, exactly. <laughs> that Space hippies! That could have easily been animated. <laughs> it could have been. It was probably one of the things they were thinking about. Right. I also feel like we should touch on the fact a little bit more on the whole idea that we get more of Chapel, we get more of Uhura, we get more of Sulu, and we get to deep dive in, the, in them, and of course Spot with Yesteryear. So, I don't know, like, I just felt... It seemed to me like Nurse Chapel had more to do in this show than the original series and had more storylines focus on her than in the entire three seasons of the original series. I wouldn't disagree with that. No. I feel like because I enjoyed the character of Nurse Chapel, my memory is that she is more in the original series, but after this most recent rewatch, it was like, she kind of only has, like three standout moments. Right, that. exactly. She's, she's not just kind of there and just responding as any, it could have been any nurse in that mm -hmm. inst instance. It, I don't know. And, and obviously it being made gel is a big part of the Star Trek universe. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the reasons I like the animated series is because you get some, some more of that. Not a whole lot. I just felt bad for her though because some of those storylines were sort of yuck. 
Oh, really? Which ones like do you the, think? Well, specifically the one where she takes the love pill and gives it to Spock. And Much passion. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah that's, oh. So I was going to... Poor Chapel. That's, a that's just embarrassing. I actually put that in my top five. I kind of like passion. that episode. I kind of like that episode. I did episode. too. It's not my top five, but... So I, I just felt bad. It made me feel cringy for her. Because I don't yeah. think... That's just... I don't know. I was embarrassed. I feel like it, it rounds out that spark of a storyline that was in the original series mm-hmm. more firmly and makes it more of a actual story as opposed to a character tick. I think it deepens Mud's character. Mm-hmm. When I didn't like him on the original series, it gives him more dimension beyond just being a profiteer and a con man. So I was going to bring up Mud's passion in more trivials, more troubles, because they didn't make neither my top or bottom. They were just like... Yeah, the trivial was in the kind yeah. of a mediocre place. Yeah, right. Lower. I agree with Plus that. Plus, I get creeped like, out by the giant like tribbles that. filled with little tribbles. Like, yeah, what's like? That? I don't know. It's like it's like it's almost nightmare fuel. Like a big grinding <laughs> ball of tribbles. <laughs> <laughs> almost like the, a furry gremlin pod. Oh no! <laughs> I didn't like the gremlins. <laughs> <laughs> the first one or the new batch? The ones after midnight. <laughs> The ones that eat the food after midnight. I liked Gizmo. (laughs) So that's even worse. (laughs) Yeah, I just, I was excited for the triple one because I love that original series episode. I love the Deep Space Nine episode. And it's written by the same guy, but it just doesn't feel... I was like, we need to get triples in there. Yeah. And then they're not very triple-like. No. Big and slow. The only good thing about that episode is when the big one's in Kirk's chair and he's just like, I'll allow it. (laughs) (laughs) I think the animated series got... Shatner to say things in situations that he probably would have been like, no. yeah, because yeah. he was just reading the words, right? And might not have mm-hmm. had the whole script, or he didn't have a giant triple to play <laughs> off of, <laughs> <laughs> but he just said whatever. But. Well, he was probably, I don't mean to say it this way, but he was probably happy he was getting a paycheck. He was paycheck. actually, his divorce just cleaned him out, and the show kind of kept him afloat at a really bad time. His memoirs are really interesting, especially this period. Kyle okay. really likes Shatner. You like I Shatner? Do. I love Shad. Uh, both. I mean, he's getting crazy in his old age. But well, there's that. Yeah. He's fun to follow on Twitter. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that fun is an interesting. But I mean, he actually he's letting more of that out. Than but I mean, I mean, I would recommend both of his memoirs covering the show. And then the movies. In the movie one, he covers the animated because it covers everything after the cancellation of the show. Mm-hmm. But he's very candid. Like he he doesn't like sugarcoat himself and like because I mean you read a lot about how the other cast had problems with him, but and also how much him and Nimoy and, and DeForest Kelly get along, but he, he doesn't sugarcoat it. He explains, like, why he butts heads with these people, and and it's very fascinating, and it's really, I mean, it adds something to these shows to know what was going on behind right. the scenes. I, I read Life, I think, was one of his books, and it was, like, the stories he told them, yeah. they, it was entertaining and interesting. It was entertaining. They were entertaining stories, Star Trek or not, mm-hmm. like, if you like Star Trek or not. But a lot of the Star Trek stuff, they did. He did touch on his relationship with Nimoy, and for that book, he like tried to talk to all the cast members so that like yeah. he can get their side a little bit more too. Duhan was the only one who was like, "I'm not talking to you." But, oh. <laughs> well, even like his first book, like Star Trek Memories, like George Takei wouldn't inter- do interviews with him and stuff because he was they were still in a dark place. But then Star Trek Movie Memories, he came back around. And even now, they're in a much better place than they were. They add to everything, especially like even the animated series. You can see like how important it was to the cast to try to make this work, despite the low budget and despite everything. Well, plus I think they felt pretty shafted after the cancellation of the original series. It was very unceremonious. NBC well, yeah. kind, you know, treated them kind of poorly by the end, slashing budgets and not giving them a lot of, you know... Pants that fit? Well, that too. <laughs> You know, and Roddenberry was so upset about, he checked out kind of during, I think, season two. He mm-hmm. wasn't a big part of the show. No, he much. was only a consulting producer on the third season. So they could have even felt abandoned by him, too. Well, even like the animated, he was trying to get an animated series started right from the cancellation of the other show. But he was butting heads with pretty much anybody he pitched it to because he wanted it to be very kid-friendly. Nobody thought it would work. It took a long time for this show to get made. But he was trying 
every day from the time it got canceled until this show aired to come on the air. Yeah, it wasn't until syndication proved the popularity that they even considered it. I wish we could watch this show with children. Like, I wanted to introduce it to my seven-year-old daughter, and I'm not sure what she really thought of it. I don't know if she was really into it when I watched one episode with her, but I wish I had been able to watch it more with her, because I feel like we should get that kid perspective since it was technically made for children. Even though, as you said, Kylie, it was watched mostly by older children and adults. So part That's of the why the toy lines bombed. <laughs> right. I think it's because they Even though adults are buying the toys now. Yeah, I was right. going to say now. <laughs> I think it's because, I mean, you've already mentioned the intellect of the show. They didn't mitigate that. Mm -hmm. no. And so I think a lot of stuff that would have been in this, even the animated series, as crazy as some of the episodes were, would have been beyond little children mm -hmm. without especially without having the original series as a backdrop right if they didn't watch that how could they appreciate the cartoon but i'm wondering if the episodes that we don't like are the ones that kids might like I, maybe there's also there's the element of time a kid now versus a kid in the well, 70s yeah, right i mean we're talking about 40 years so yeah, 45 other yeah. fast move uh, also know. the way the format of tv shows now are so different i feel like kids i know my nieces and nephews would like be like Change the channel, this is boring. Yeah, like a, a movie nowadays is kind of long for younger kids. Yeah. I mean, I think it's partially boring, so I can't <laughs> imagine what a kid's going to think. Oh, no, I had a, a flying serpent in outer space. That could have been good for kids. You know, again, they tried stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean it worked. <laughs> mm, no, I didn't think that one worked. That's why I said my bottom five. And I'm going to have trouble remembering... I mean, I've got my rankings, but mm -hmm. I'm going to have trouble remembering what all the plots were, especially so the sure. ones I didn't So I'm going to go kind of jerk. I, I forgot a lot of the titles, too. So, but Before we get to our top five, bottom five businesses, got to ask you a couple of questions per this looking back business. So do you think this show has aged well? Why or why not? Well, <laughs> it is. I think it's too much of a product of its time to have aged well. Yeah. yeah. I think it, like I was saying before, I think it goes with the original series well enough. You have to be a hardcore this... Star Trek fan to really, yes, really like yeah. feel something with this one. You can't just say... Oh, you like Next Generation? Watch this show. You'll love it. Yeah, like, that'll never work. Yeah. No, you, I think you specifically have to want some more from the characters. And like we have already said a couple times, some of the, the side characters. Even though the quicker pacing... It's weird to say that this show has quick pacing, but I feel like some of the dialogue and the lines no, delivered are... Like they didn't Spock have almost, time to waste. They had to put the 22 minutes to efficient use. Spock, Spock well, and McCoy, well. and, and a lot of times... And McCoy's it lowered the joking. recording sessions to lower studio costs. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> but there's an episode where, like, Spock says, we don't lift the tail up, we dig the doctor out. And just the pacing of it, it sounded like a joke and got a chuckle out of it. <laughs> but I don't see it like... The original series didn't doesn't really last... The test of time, the original series, obviously, but that's also a product of its time as well, and that you need to watch with a grain of salt. Like, I'm very hesitant to suggest people start with the original series when I'm suggesting Star Trek go to, like, a Voyager or a Deep Space Nine. Oh. Really? I, I tell people to watch one of each, so I tell people mm. to watch the original series because it's the original series. Like, that's where it started. Especially if they're a Doctor Who fan, I kind of compare it to the classic versus the new. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that comparison. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how people got me into Doctor Who. You, they basically said, start with Doctor Nine because the special effects are better and it's like watching The Next Generation. If you go back to the beginning, it'll be like watching the original series of Star Trek with really bad special effects. But my thought process with Star Trek these days has really changed because start with Discovery. I don't know. You can start there, and then if you want to know more about what's happening, there's all this other stuff if you like that see, to go into. See, for me, I do the, when I introduce somebody, it's the one who I haven't watched Space Seed and then Wrath of Khan, because then they can see how this low-budget show turns Turned into this into amazing, dramatic mm -hmm. space operas. Right. And then usually, too, by then, if the kind of cheesy 60s budget then they can see the actors like really at their best and then they want more of those characters and then they're willing to go back through the entire three seasons and then really get the broad aspect of it. I recommend a few episodes of the original series that are good. You know, that would have been on my top ten. And then 
I say try the next generation because I think that people love those characters. Do you have people start from season one of next gen? Yes. That's hard. It's hard, yeah. I don't know. There's some good There's I some think good ones season in there. two I... is the clunkiest one. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't have Code of Honor in it. <laughs> I just watched that one. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that one's problematic. We'll get to that in our Next Generation Season 1 episode, but no, they're, like, I think Encounter at Farpoint is by far one oh. of the best pilots ever. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. And it introduces Q, and it introduces all the characters and how they're all related, and mm -hmm. gives you their histories even, and I just think... Very efficient. It is. It's mm -hmm. really well written, and so I think DC Fontana wrote it, by the way. It's just a really fun kind of good introduction. I know Roddenberry created the character of Q in that storyline. But I he think was she very much He was very much hands-on on the first episode, like, with her. The whole first season, Roddenberry was, like, very... It was, they, they started to pull him back second and third, like late second and third season. He was starting to get sick anyway. And, well, and he was starting to get really weird ideas, which yeah. was partially brought on by his illness. Like yeah. he was, and kind of belligerent. But that's for the next generation episodes, which we're not doing right now. To answer your question, no, it hasn't aged well. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Good answering I this question. I disagree with that statement. Okay. Michael. And why I mean, I don't think, I don't think it's aged any poor, more poorly than any of the other Star Trek. I'm saying, like, compared to other 70s shows, though, like Scooby-Doo, well, I mean, would, is, do you think it's still as rewatchable as, like, shows like that? Yes. I would just as soon watch this as any of that. Oh, I love the do. But I... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, even, like, modern kids, like, like Scooby-Doo is still huge Who with... talks like that? <laughs> the do. A Scooby-Doo aficionado. Like the... Stop judging him. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, like, but what I mean, like, how Scooby-Doo is still big with kids, like... Yeah, there's a the show. Coming out. Yeah. I know. I will see it. I mean, what kids? Who's watching the old Scooby Doo? I mean, they like like the new movies, I think. I don't know. I think kids might be watching. Yeah, I think it kids are. Cartoon, I mean, they have. They replayed the 70s shows on Cartoon Network. Okay. I guess. Do you watch Scooby Doo? I do not watch Scooby Doo. I do have Scooby Doo floor mats in my car, but that's a really long story. So. It's a short story. <laughs> they are, were mine. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess you could do that. That's true. That's <laughs> so there you go. Well, Scooby Doo episode. Maybe so. I don't know. I, I told you you're in charge of the animated you, arm. <laughs> don't you think it's kind of retro though? I don't know. I feel like I. I guess I don't. I mean, I would. Admittedly, I don't know what's cool, but I feel like this isn't any more annoying than all those other cartoons people would watch. It might hold up better than Snorks. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I wait. What? Snorks is that the sea monkey one? It's the one. It's the it's, it's those Smurfs underwater cousins. characters with they have yeah, the little they're like, I, so I always call them sea monkeys, but yeah, yeah. that's a, what other cartoons came out of the '70s that I would even watch? I remember watching Super 80s. Friends, Fred Flintstone, the Flintstones and the Jetsons. That's like the late '70s, right? Those are early. Those are late '60s. Well, those are, I mean, they were on in the '70s. Well, they don't, yeah. Yeah. they don't feel dated, but they're period pieces. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> this is period. <laughs> The future. It doesn't feel like it's the future. No. <laughs> the Jetsons feels more futuristic. Yes. What about the Jackson 5 cartoon? I mean, hello. That one feels dated, Mike. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Was the animated series canceled too soon? Should it have ended sooner or did it end at the right time? I didn't need any more of it. I mean, they, I mean, they commissioned well, 22 episodes. It didn't sell toys, so they let it go. Also, the fact that it's literally like most cartoons made for children they didn't need to make more than 22 episodes because they knew it was going to run in reruns for who knows how Forever long Forever infinity. yeah exactly i mean i mean every single cartoon we grew up with in the 80s early 90s whatever 65 was the magic number and you watched all 65 episodes in like four weeks because or however many if it was a daily show you know however many weeks it would take for 65 Days. I guess I didn't keep track of it. Yeah, like so, I mean, you watched every episode within, like, two, three months. And then you would, but exactly, because you didn't keep track of it because you're a child and you don't realize how often you're seeing the same episodes over and over again. You would see your favorite episode and think, oh, man, I love this episode. And then all the other episodes that you weren't really all that into, you'd be like, oh, this is a good episode. I've probably seen it already. You wouldn't realize it. So, yeah, it didn't end too soon because it didn't technically end. I agree with Nick. I didn't need any more of it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. 
It's like we got the movies. Yeah, the we, movies. We've gotten to yes. bigger and yes. better things. Yes, I agree. And we already talked about whether or not we would recommend it. So, it is now time to do the top five, bottom five. Now, we didn't talk about a lot of these episodes. So, to the extent that you can remember <laughs> the plot summary, please remind us of what it is. I will go last on the best one, but otherwise, I don't care what order we go in. Who would like to start? Well, Let's do the worst ones first. Oh, worst ones? Okay. I can start. I'm, just one. before you start, Michael, I wrote little synopses in my notes, so if you can't remember, I might have it. Oh, awesome. cool. Awesome. I'll start with my bottom five. So, so do you start. want me to start with one, the worst, and go to five, or should the, I start with five, the least worst, and go to two, the worst? The second one. The second one. Okay. So, for me... I chose my bottom five based on the idea of which ones did I fall asleep on and which ones did I have to remind myself what the plot synopsis was. And if I fell asleep and couldn't remember it, it probably made my bottom five. So starting with the least, one of our planets is missing, which is like the <laughs> second or third episode in the running order that we would third. have done on Netflix. Mm -hmm. That was just like, eh, you know, whatever. Just not really all that interesting. What was the plot summary on that one, Sarah? Cloud creature. Cloud creature. Yeah, and just saying cloud creature automatically turns me off because literally <laughs> so so many episodes of the original series were either about cloud creatures or... I mean, it also sounds like the plot of the motion picture. Right. Yeah. Which, again, I will defend my dying day, but... I would, defend it, I would defend it over this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my number five. I number four is the Aztec episode. The so how sharper than a serpent's tooth. tooth. The Aztec god in the sky. I didn't rank that one, but mm -hmm. I can see why you would. <laughs> yeah, I just thought it was just like so ridiculously out there and confusing in certain but it aspects. had the cool puzzle thing with the lights and the and business. i just did not give one heck of a care at all about the puzzle it was great animation i suppose because it was and you they know, floated yeah the floating which is easy to do in animation you just literally shift the cell you didn't need a rocket pack for it yeah right so that's my number again these are like my least worst episodes sure number three <laughs> Probably controversial choice was more troubles, more troubles. Not really. I, it's not that great. Okay, no. I just Quit don't. As a sequel <laughs> to the, as a sequel to the triples episode of the original series, <laughs> it's not great. Oh it's just useless and obviously a grab to be like, hey, remember that triple cute little pink furry thing that you watched on the original series ten years ago? Let's do another show. Well, so not ten years toys ago, out of it. more like mm -hmm. five years ago. But yeah, still. that's a triples are a cheap toy, toy to make, <laughs> right? <laughs> You could even just do a stuffed thing and put a sound in it and it goes... I mean, I have oh. one upstairs. <laughs> there you go. And my number two was... My number two and number one are very linked, and they're literally back-to-back -back episodes. Number two was The Magics of Magus 2, which is the weird... Space... Is that the Space Devil? I, space Devil. I think it yeah, is Yeah, that's space the weird devil. Space Devil episode, and the worst one mm. for me was Once Upon a Planet, which is that like... That makes my list. That is just like... Once Once Upon a Planet about? It's the one where they literally... They're back in the amusement you. park planet, and oh, there's a yeah. computer oh, in charge. Oh, it's the sequel to Short Leaf. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, That's why I ranked it. Yeah. I didn't like that. I was going to say, yeah, no, nobody really liked Short Leaf. We didn't need more. <laughs> right, and it's just like... This is not even... This is clearly just a excuse to make storybook characters in a children's show that is remotely linked to Star Trek. I also so. think it's easier to churn out an episode or a script if you're just like, let's continue something. this story, or let's go back there. I right. Know, without and I, a real reason to. I probably fell asleep the fastest on that episode. That probably good. Like helpful. Two or three minutes in, it's like, oh, I'm done. So, yeah, that's my bottom five. I think it's just like any episode that was just not memorable, not of any substance at all, I think that's what it is. I have some, a couple of honorable, dishonorable mentions. Sure. The Pirates of Orion, just that boring in general. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and then the Slaver Weapon might be kind of a controversial choice as a dishonorable mention. It because is. that's the one where it's actually written by Larry Niven, mm -hmm. who, where he wrote it at, well, he wrote a short story that was had nothing to do with Star Trek, and they adapted the short story to the animated series. But I just like what's this? What's this one about again? It's it's the space pirates, but not it's not space pirates. But they basically have there's an alien species that has this 
Do they swim in this one? They don't swim in that one. Sir, do you have the plot synopsis for the slaver it, weapon? It, no, I didn't mention it at all. I have a little teeny tiny bit because it, it made my top five. It, it did mine too. Oh, they're delivering the artifact. It reminds, yeah. mm -hmm. and it also reminds me of a next gen episode. Spock, Uhura, and Sulu discover an ancient multi-use weapon and are captured by the Kizinti, who are equally interested in it. Oh, they're and they're on like this icy planet. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yep, I remember now. And it's cool. I mean, I hate to say that it's, it's one of my hot. dishonorable mentions due to the fact that yeah, it's <laughs> cool that it features Sulu and Uhura and Spock, but I just like because it was written not as a Star Trek episode. It just had this weird, I don't know, I just didn't connect with it as a Star Trek episode. And I don't know if that's just because I knew that it was written And this isn't in elsewhere. your bottom five? It's... it's not in my bottom five, it's a dishonorable mention. Okay. It's sort of like, eh. Alright, I can try to go next and see how much I remember. Go for it, Nick. I have the Survivor as one of them, not my least hated. That's the one where... I think they find someone from the Federation that was supposed to have been dead. Yeah, like oh, it was five years in the neutral time. zone or mm -hmm. whatever. Yep. I actually mm -hmm. think that might be the one. Yep, that's the one with Ted Knight, who I love as a person. Caddyshack, anyone? No? Isn't he Judge Small? Yeah. I, that's a boys movie. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh huh? Yep, I've watched Ted Knight is the, is the yeah. voice of Carter Winston, yeah. Ooh, I can't. Uncredited. Is he, is he on Blossom? Is he the grandpa on Blossom? I don't the know. dad on Blossom. I don't think I, he's the dad on I don't Blossom. think he's the dad. He would have been way too... No, he's a, he's more... not Maybe not more known no, for, but he's on I the Mary Tyler him. Moore show as a regular and then Too Close for Comfort. Those are the two big scenes. Oh, yeah, Too yeah. Close mm -hmm. to Comfort. But Mary Tyler Moore show was, I think, His bigger a thing. big thing. Yeah, Just because that show was so big. Sure. Right. Man, I really can't remember Beyond the Farthest Star, but I maybe that's why it's down there. Oh, that's that's, on, that's the first one where it was. That's, that's the, the first, first one of the one. running order where they were where they have they find that that ship and they kind of have that oh. weird like it has a to me that has a where no man has gone before vibe to it mm -hmm. and a vibe to it like the the next generation episode that's sort of similar to where no one man has gone before it's where no one has gone before there you go i yeah. just watched that one too yeah so it's got <laughs> the same vibe of those two and to me that's why i like it and i think it's a good introduction but I, that's not my top five then after that i have how sharper than a serpent's tooth which is the aztec god mm -hmm. and i think it's towards the end of well both seasons but towards the end of the sixth episode of the season two so i think out of all the ridiculous ones it's just more at the top of my memory so that's why i think stood out more as one i didn't really like yeah then after that i have the counter clock incident where oh they're slowly turning into babies and then oh, yeah. oh we nobody has to age ever because that's the transporters the exist ugh <laughs> I didn't care for it. I didn't put it on my list, but it is real grown worthy. And then it's a combination of two other two next gen episodes where Plasti's getting older and they use the transporter. But if they make it a big deal out of how difficult and risky that is as opposed to it at, at the end of this it's like nobody has to age anymore. <laughs> you just step in the transporter once every couple of years and you're back to being whatever age you wanna be. <laughs> and then I put it as my least favorite. Don't all fight me about it, but the Practical Joker, where the ship is just giggling. That's the whole my most time. hated episode. And there's oh, just huh? pulling pranks on them all. And <laughs> I um, didn't rank it, but I don't like it very much. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's my absolute. I hate that episode. <laughs> the only oh, reason yeah. I kind of like that episode. I wish I could remember, but there's something in that episode. I needed to watch it again before tonight, but I forgot to. The but computer is flirtatious too. It's I don't weird. know if it's that, but, but there's he... something in that episode that I was like, I like that. That's cool. It's not the introduction of the holodeck, which that episode does, but there's something else about that episode that I actually kind of liked, and I can't remember what it was. But if you want to enjoy that concept, just watch Futurama, where Sigourney Weaver is the voice of. Yes. And and it's That's also a brilliant a, episode. It is so good. <laughs> And it has elements of that, but it's well done and funny. And and also she plays off Bender, who's always, yes. I mean, he's my favorite character. <laughs> <laughs> and, so. and Sigourney Weaver is just always, always there in sci-fi. She's a national treasure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True Whether story. it's the voice of the ship in Wally -E or this, or mm -hmm. Galaxy Quest, she's there. Mm -hmm. That's one of my honorable mentions, is, uh, the, the, is, the, <laughs> is the practical joker, honestly. Honorable oh. mention? No. Yeah. Well, that was my bottom five. <laughs> Good job. That was my number one least favorite. I'll go next. Okay. For the most part, it was a lot of these are season two. Yeah, me the too. The later episodes. Five, How Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth, the, the Aztec one. Mm -hmm. And then also 
counterclock incident, it just flatlined for me. Them, because of the really weird guy that could pull up, go into different parts of his body. Like the triple thing, like to me that's like nightmare. Like, <laughs> it's just so freaking weird. You like horror <laughs> movies. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, if, can you picture that scene? But he also scene? doesn't like cartoons, so yeah. you've got to take attention. <laughs> and it's just, so <laughs> it's just so ridiculous. Plus the plot's similar to some other Star Trek episodes where it's done so much better. Then Mud's passion, because the Love Crystals thing. And I, I found her drugging Spock to be, like, it's weird. And in a, this moral society, it, it feels off. But she was under the influence, Kyle. <laughs> anyway, it, it falls flat to me. Plus, I never liked the character of Mud. I didn't like him in live action, True. so I mean, I agree. <laughs> so him coming back didn't do anything for me. He must have been popular because they used him a lot. Yeah, three yeah. times. I mean, oh, and they're three still times? using him. Season Discovery. Yeah. Oh, more than that. Okay. So Rain Wilson. Oh, it's Wilson? right. I forgot about that. He is. Rain yeah. Wilson is mud. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's yeah. Wilson. Yeah. Is Rain Wilson. Yeah. That goes against Bears Beats and Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> but okay. So that was three, and then the fourth one is the magics of Megas. To Space, Devil. Space Devil. Right. And then, as I said, <laughs> the practical Joker, the Enterprise becoming a prankster and playing mm -hmm. pranks on him. Like, that, to me, that's too ridiculous. Too out there, even for a cartoon. I, feel like I love they a good sell Space it, Devil. Though. Oh, man. I don't think I they wish... sell it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had watched that episode right before tonight so that I could have defended that episode better. I know I liked it when I watched it. But I mean, it's it. all you personal have taste. To be no. <laughs> It's personal taste for me. I know, but I love the Starship Enterprise, and for me, it's like it's as important of a character as Kirk himself. So to go that low brow with the Enterprise itself to me was a no-no. Well, and you get in Next Gen, you get the Enterprise kind of having sentience, and and it yeah, and it's actually like working with them, and it's right. like it is. It's as if the the crew. It just means so much that this is the personality and the life that they've given this ship. Whereas in this, it's like, a uh, slap in the face. Yeah, and like, if they want to do a silly concept, they would do the holodeck, not like the ship itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have strong feelings <laughs> to counter. I don't know why you're doing Yeah! <laughs> I just also have to say, not that I love the magics of Magus 2, but a space devil is just fun. I mean, it is funny, <laughs> and I love to make fun of it, but it just... Like I me. said, when it started, I was like, okay, let's see where this is going. But then it went places. <laughs> <laughs> I realized how many, I don't know, never mind. There's a lot of next gen in the animated series. A lot of seeds. Space okay. seeds. No, 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 not those. <laughs> Sarah, do you want to go or do you want me to go? I'll go. Okay. Number, well, I'm not married to my order for my worst ones, that, but this is it. This is sort of it. I guess my five least one is the time trap where the Klingons and the humans have to cooperate and of course they can't and blah oh, blah blah was sense. what I wrote because I'm just tired of that. She's not a big Klingon I mean, fan. Aww. I'm not a huge Klingon fan. You grabbed your forehead like when them. you said it. <laughs> that means you really don't like them. Nick well, said you yeah. grabbed your forehead when you said it. You you had a poker tell there. She's confused. Anyway, <laughs> my next one is Once Upon a Planet. It wasn't good the first time, and it wasn't good the second time. I don't need this nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> then my third most disliked was Mud's Passion, because I just think Christine is better than that, and I don't like how she was used, and, I, and it made me upset, and I didn't care for it. My second most disliked was The Practical Joker. I thought it was nonsensical and strange, and I didn't enjoy it. Wow. Sorry, Michael. I was going to have a coronary. I, I just really wish I rewatched it for this episode. I, I mean, I saw it with a binge, but I just I can't remember why it was so good in my mind. Yeah. My most disliked was The Eye of the Beholder, where they get trapped in an alien zoo. What? Oh, I kind of like that one. It's not ranked, but I kind of like that one. I don't remember that one. I'm sorry, but didn't we already do that for the cage and the menagerie? The menagerie. I don't need this again. Well, that was but what that's I part thought. of my problem, too. Like, if another episode has done the same themes better, it automatically makes the second episode rank lower. Sure. Yeah. I just didn't think it was one of the worst. I mean, that's one of the better concepts they recycled. Just saying. That's my thought. Those are my thoughts. So, I think a lot of mine have been mentioned, maybe not, we'll see. My best of the worst, my number five is Pirates of Orion. 
thought was real dumb. My <laughs> number four was BEM for all the things that Kyle says, yeah. basically <laughs> where I'm at. My number three was Beyond the Farthest Star. I thought for a first episode that was incredibly clunky. Yeah, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> And going along Kyle's reasoning of earlier concepts done better, I felt this did echo those episodes you were talking about, but in a much worse way. And I didn't really love those episodes, so in the end, I just felt that way. Once Upon a Planet is number two, because what Sarah said, I just didn't need it. I did not like Shirley very much. <laughs> so I don't know why they came back to that episode. I just got real impatient with it. My number one worse is the Infinite Vulcan because I don't like Spock Godzilla, and I'm sorry. <laughs> that was just a terrible... That was new brain level worse for me, okay? Has Walter <laughs> Koenig written anything since then? Because seriously, he's know. not known as a writer, so... <laughs> no, I know. And, you know, I, I want to commend Walter for using Spock as the right. focal point. Mm -hmm. He is, again, like Bones. He's my other favorite character, but that story is just incredibly so stupid and weird. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he's still out there. He's There's still a giant out there. Spock out there. <laughs> In a dimension far and yeah, it was I did not I did not feel good about clone giant Spock just like I didn't feel good about taking his brain out and putting it back in. It reminded me of a new brain mm -hmm. and I hated it. So Spock's brain, not a new brain. Spock's brain. Is a new brain a musical? It is. Oh, okay. It's a musical. Should we yes. sing a little bit? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, one day we'll do a musical thing just for you. <laughs> I'm very excited. <laughs> now we'll talk about our best episodes. Let's end this on a high note. I'll go last again. Who'd like to start this one? I can me, me, me. Well, Sarah no, will. me because Sarah will. I'm going <laughs> to. Okay, go. Because I went almost last, last time, so I get to go first. Sarah, no one's okay. arguing. You go. <laughs> my, okay, my number five is in season two. It's called Albatross. It's where McCoy is accused of starting a plague. All right. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> Plagues are fun. As plagues are. <laughs> yeah, right. The bubonic one was especially a party. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> Four hundred years. <laughs> it's back. There are confirmed cases of bubonic plague on the planet right now. Number four, my <laughs> oh, number that's... four favorite is the Terratin incident. This is where everybody shrinks. All right. I don't yes. know why I like it. I just do. <laughs> I agree with that. I had trouble with the physics of it, so I didn't rank it. <laughs> yes. I would have loved to have seen the him try this one on the live action. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, I put the Jihad. This is where they go on this mission, and there's already been, like, three missions where all the people didn't, they all died, and then there's, like, a bird guy, and he's, there like, a mole. There's so many aliens. <laughs> Harvey Birdman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I agree with you. I, I like that episode. I like that episode. I, I, I think there's so many cool aliens in it. Yes. It's good. Number two is the Lorelei signal. This is where the females have to go save the men who are all... Hells yeah. Right. That's on my list. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Me too. A lot. My number first favorite, that's not English, but you got the point, <laughs> is yesteryear where Spock has to go back in time and save himself. Yes. It's really good. Agreed. Check it out. Everyone. I'm going to go next because I have four repeats, so this will go quick. My number five oh. is the Terratin incident. My number four is the one I don't think Is Sarah the Terratin one where they were swimming? No, no, that's no, the, the, the Amber Griff the shrinking. element. Oh, the God, Amber Griff right. element. Ah. <laughs> that makes me laugh. My number four was the slaver weapon, and maybe because I, I didn't mind it, and it didn't remind me of a next-gen episode I like, where and, they're trying to get that Vulcan peace weapon. Yeah. And it's actually very similar now that I'm looking at to the plot of Star Trek Beyond, mm -hmm. where they, they go to the planet as ambassadors, and they get this ancient piece of a weapon. It's almost oh, the same plot. Interesting. Oh, well, yeah, and they're running through that red field. I guess I just didn't like the Kazinti on that episode. Okay. <laughs> and then my next three are the Jihad, which Sarah mentioned, 
Then I have my number two is yesteryear oh. because I enjoyed the Lorelei signal that much more. Wow! I mean, they're both strong episodes. Yeah. Wow. But here's the funny thing: that's my exact two and one too. Like I put yesteryear at number two. I agree. It's, Would you like to go? I said Michael might as well. He gave away half his list in one go. <laughs> well, basically, almost every episode we've mentioned is as in my top five. Number five was every episode we've mentioned. This well, entire yeah. five. <laughs> but I mean, like, okay, here's a controversial choice. My number five is the counterclock incident. You're wrong. I like. I'm gonna leave. Now. I like. I like in that episode. The fact that it is an, because it is an animated cartoon, they knew they could not do this type of story in the live action. It would be too much on makeup. It would be too much on various other reasons. And I like the idea. Again, this is also the nostalgia factor. The nostalgia factor also comes into play here because this is one of the episodes I remember watching more than once when I watched it on Nickelodeon. So for me, this brings in the fact that I remember the episode from a kid, I watched it as an adult when I'm 37 now, and I still thought to myself, that's an awesome episode. I like it then, I like it now, and I like the fact that, I like it that it reintroduces Robert April, which is not mentioned oh. much in the... And that's also why they didn't canonize it, mm -hmm. because now... Christopher Pike has always been the first. Yes, and Robert April was kind of brought into this. I guess actually he's introduced in this episode, not reintroduced, because the Robert April is thought to be, in some way, thought to be the first captain before Christopher Pike. I'm not. A, I'm not hip to that. Yeah, <laughs> not in my Star Trek. Yeah, yeah. not my Star Trek. Oh, oh, oh dear. I don't know. I liked it. I liked the fact that... He'd be um, the captain of the HMS Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I, I don't know. I just... I, the nostalgia factor... D, the, don't sing it. <laughs> I like the story of them de-aging. This also goes into my number four, which is the Turretin incident. I like the fact that they go smaller. Again, that's something they couldn't do in the original series. So it works well as a cartoon, and they're able to do something... That I like the fact that although the physics might be a little wonky in that episode, <laughs> it still works for me. The idea that's like, oh my god, we're getting smaller, and they deal with the fact that they can't pilot the ship, they can't stand, they have to stand up on the chairs and have to climb onto the consoles. And again, it works. It's for Alice me. in Wonderland without the mushrooms. Yes. Okay. Good. But I think it Space does. Mushrooms. In both cases, <laughs> I think it's done well. I was saying in the seventies, the writers they might have been on mushrooms. <laughs> My number three is the Eye of the Beholder, because I think that has a really good... What's that one about? It, yeah. The zoo, where they are... Where oh, they're, right, the zoo. Oh, but that's the, why the you reverse got zoo. <laughs> <laughs> The reverse zoo, where they're, you know, they think all the aliens are, you know, are interesting species that they can observe, but they're the ones being observed as humans, and they're the ones in a zoo. So I just think it takes that concept, and it makes it work well. The fact that aliens don't have any form of communication whatsoever, I think it's great the way they are able to discern and learn their form of communication and the whole telepathic element works well, I think. If I had an honorable mention, that would be mm -hmm. the honorable and mention. And then my two and one are, are exactly the same as Nick's. My number two is Yesteryear because that episode is freaking brilliant, but my number one is the Slorelay signal. But here's where we get interesting. I like that episode because it's so freaking cheesy. It is cheesy. And it's funny that we mentioned the fact that we said that, oh, well, they were able to make 22 minutes fly by fast. That's an episode where they actually show where the running time is padded out very obviously. There's an incident like halfway through the episode where Scotty is humming a song because he's being taken over by the sirens and it's literally just like a minute shot of the Enterprise going past the planet and you hear James Doohan just singing some random Irish or Scottish song to himself. And it's like just a minute of this. And it's like, clearly, they had to pat out this episode. But for whatever reason, the cheesiness of that just make, I love it. Plus, I love the fact that it is the only episode in any of the original series, whether you consider it season four or whatever, where Uhura and Chapel 
are badasses and take over the ship and the women are just amazing in that episode and just like god these men being so Not i don't child. even know the word for it being taken over by the sirens thing i don't know i love that episode it's cheesy but i also think it's a really cool story yes i'm very passionate you're all giving me looks like what is you're, on right now you're you're fine with the passion just you're amping <laughs> <laughs> like as your list goes on the the, the level goes up <laughs> So we just thought we'd let you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, like it's, I've been telling you guys for like the last several weeks, I could not wait to do this episode. It's true. Because, he was the yeah. most excited to talk about the yeah. animated series. My turn? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Number five, The Survivor, which is where they find the survivor in the Romulan neutral I like zone. I love Romulan episodes, especially these early ideas of exploring that neutral zone, because we really didn't learn that much about it in the original series. There's always this interesting concept in this past to this world. Then the Albatross, because... It's just a great McCoy episode, all-around good episode. And then I'm trying to think of the name of the episode. I think it's The Time Trap. Oh, Mostly yeah. because mm -hmm. one of my all-time mm -hmm. favorite characters, Core, he's voiced by a different actor. But I love the Klingon Core. It's a character they bring back again multiple times, especially like playing off Worf. I love this character. He could have just been a one-off villain, but they actually ended up giving him this whole history throughout all the series. And so like I consider, even though a lot of this isn't considered canon, I consider that canon because I like having him more of him and Kirk, especially him having to work with Kirk, which is a theme they go on later, but this is like the very first instant of it. Then the Lorelei incident, because of Uhura, or Lorelei signal, sorry. It's easy <laughs> sorry. to get that one prop. Because all the reasons people said, it's great to see Uhura take command of the ship and save all these people in the way that the writers of the original show would have loved to have done and they just couldn't. And then obviously my number one is Yesteryear. There's a reason why they mimic scenes from this anytime they go back to Spock's childhood. Like, mm -hmm. The idea is proposed. I mean, it's so good. It is, it is exactly. It's basically a lot of the search for Spock. You know, right. Comes from this episode. Yeah, and the J.J. Abrams Star Trek. I mean, there are scenes with him with the bullies as a kid that are literally in this episode. For me, like, getting an idea of everything of Spock's life, this is a key episode. You have to watch it. Excellent. Good job, guys. I have a lot of episodes that have already been mentioned. They're just not in the same order, but for one... So number five, I have the slaver weapon. Remind me which one that is again. They're finding the, Romul the, the weapon. The, yeah. yeah, the peace weapon. I just, -weapon. I think I had the same sort of reverberation that Nick did. It reminds me of a next gen episode. I think it's kind. It felt very Star Trek when I watched it. It has a lot of that diplomacy aspect to it. You get a lot of Spock in it. I mean, I think that's why I like it, and that's why I put it on my top five. Number four for me is the Lorelei signal. I rated it down further because of the cheesiness. Right. But I love the fact that it's the women taking charge. Yeah! Ahura had such a great arc in that mm -hmm. episode. And Chapel so too. But mm -hmm. I felt Ahura was kind of just a token, a symbol for a long time on the original series itself. And it starts with the animated series and expands into the movie. She starts being given more to do, and I think that's great. Number three, I have the time trap, because I like the Klingons. <laughs> so the Klingons will always feature on my list, because I think of all the alien species, they've developed them the most. I relate to them the most in terms of their history and just knowing about them. So... And I do think Kor is a really excellent character that they've really put some continuity to. For number two, I actually put Mutt's passion because... Can I give you a high five for that one? <laughs> I like that one. I'm sorry. I, I mean, there's nothing you. wrong with that. I just, I never connected to that character. I actually like him now in Discovery more than I ever did on any of these other shows. I don't really love Mud, and I don't, I know it's problematic that yes, Chapel very much drugs so. very much so. Spock mm -hmm. with the crystal... But <laughs> I like the the sort of cheesiness of it. There's much more banter yes. there. Mm -hmm. And it again, it deepened the mud character for me where I don't like him very much either. But maybe I had a little bit more of a like for him just because of this. And I felt it was also, it utilized the whole cast very well. So that's why I put, and it was the only sequel that I felt Worked. Worked. Mm -hmm. So that's why I gave it. But number one for me is also yesteryear. I mean, Spock, the Vulcans, everything that Kyle said, it's so quintessential. It's so well done. It's the second episode of the whole series, and you really just... I mean, I, I love every time we go back to Vulcan. Again, like the Klingons, they're given the most kind of fleshing out in the canon, and this is one of the 
episodes that it does that in. And plus, I just think it was really delicately acted and voice acted by Leonard Nimoy. Mm -hmm. and Very I, much so. Yeah, a lot of good deference to to the history there. So, I think it's brilliant. How um, does that episode rank amongst all of the original series? Do we think? Well, I mean, that is one of, of my questions. In a lot of Star Trek rankings, like where they rank every single show. That's that one actually is always pretty high. So the, here's my next question. Now that we've shared our bottom five, top five, really the top five is what I want you to focus on. Would any of those top five supersede any of your top ten of the original series? Ooh. Mm. Just just yesteryear for me. Which one would it replace? Do you remember your top ten? Not really. It's been. I don't think it would replace any for me. I like my top ten from. A lot from the original series. I know it wouldn't replace anything in my top five, but I don't remember any below my top five, so. Yeah, I think it would, for me, too, it could potentially creep in there at, like, number ten. Especially for, like, when you look at, like, Journey to Babel. Like, That's yesteryear, uh, yesteryear, like, feels like, it's hard for me not to, to separate those because it's, it's Spock's life from beginning to that point. So for me, like when I think of it, I, I lump those I lump any of the plot lines together. I know what I'll do. I'll go listen back to the first three episodes we recorded, and I will make notes of all of my top <laughs> tens and all of my bottom tens, and then I will keep this in this notebook I have, and this will be my Star Trek notebook. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. And now we all know. <laughs> I'm not that partial to like the, the last three in my top ten. I like them, obviously. That's why they're in their top ten. So I can see the Laura Lie signal in yesteryear maybe replacing them. It doesn't make me like those any less. It's hard to say replacing them, but I think those two episodes for me are, are pretty, they're pretty close. They're yeah. like up there. Mm -hmm. I would, on, on a list of like my favorite Star Trek that's out there, those wouldn't feel out of place to include those. That's why it's weird. It is a hard, is this canon? Is this not canon? It's hard to say that all of this is canon, but it definitely is Star Trek. Sarah, what do you think? I don't <laughs> want to change my top ten. Can't make her. I like, I like my top two for animated a lot. But in a different way, it's hard to compare it. And like Nick said, yeah, it's hard to think about, is it to... canon? Is it not canon? I mean, I think it's canon, but it just feels like a whole different thing to me. So I don't want to lift out. I'm looking back at my top 10 now, but I don't really, I don't want to change it. I, I mean, my number nine were the Doomsday Machine and my number 10 was the Cheaty Tie of Mirror Mirror and the Devil in the Dark. And I think all three of those are so good. I can't put yesteryear above... I can't put right, yesteryear Right, yeah, above I can see that. I can put yesteryear above my bottom ten. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Especially space hippies. The space hippies. Come on. <laughs> Cats I just pop. did joke for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe I'll try to remember this next time I rewatch animated series with the question of canon. But when it was brought up at the beginning of the episode, I was like, wasn't there something that was like, oh, I see why this isn't canon. And now after Kyle pointed it out, Pike's the first captain. Yeah, I, yeah. like I that discovery has really put that oh, over yeah. the edge. Like, people. I mean, well, now that we've got a better history, we know when it was commissioned. We know it's. We know the entire history well, of the discovery, Enterprise. Not only discovery, but new timeline. I mean, that was oh, all. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and and but discovery, like bringing number one back and having Spock spend time with them more too. It's that's gonna be really. There's, yeah, really I mean, there's no way you say, can fit Robert oh, Abel anywhere. Too. Yeah, that's why. So, Sorry, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Again, that probably stems from the fact that my in my teen years, I read a lot of the non-canon books, and Robert April pops up in a couple of those, and one of some of the better ones. So, I can see that. So, anything else that you want to say that you haven't covered or feel you need to get out? about the animated series at did, this point. Did we talk enough about how awesome <laughs> James Doohan and Nichelle Nichols and is it Majel or Majel Barrett? I always thought it was Majel, but he keeps saying Majel. <laughs> anyway. I barely could tell. I hear Bolt, like, because, like, anything I watch, like, about the Star Trek history, they pronounce it Bolt, so. I'm going to say Majel because that's alive. the way I say it. <laughs> Yeah, right, I know, honestly. She recorded enough of her voice so that they can use her as the computer for all eternity. <laughs> so we can have her pronouncing it either way. <laughs> she never did, though. She did. She they literally added ex had recording sessions so that they can make her say her name. No, sit, make any word combination. They've done the phonetic speaking with so the she, idea yeah, she, of they could, when you pass away, we can recreate 
any, any word and sentence. Like, so it's so essentially bad. the same way they came up with Siri. They had a lady record so many Susan words. Susan Bennett, she follows me on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. It is amazing. And but she never said her name. That's the thing. So even if right. you piece together syllables, I, that's, I, that was the joke I was making. We could be uh, per se. I uh, 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 whoever wants to be right can be uh, right. I'm sorry, we missed that as a joke. Uh, yeah, yeah, Nick, you were dry. Anyway, I don't know. Did, did we I talk know, about did, it enough? I feel like yeah, we probably. didn't. Oh. <laughs> oh, never mind. Maybe we did. <laughs> I don't know, maybe from my aspect, from my perspective, I just felt like because they were the three that were used, it's like, oh, we need a character, so let's just use one of you three. James Doohan, there were times I didn't Well, James Doohan could do almost any accent. Right. Like, and he was, as I mentioned before, he wrote, he came up with the Vulcan language, mm -hmm. he came up with the Klingon, or the start of the Vulcan, somebody filled it in, but he came up with all of the Klingon language. Like, he, doing voices and linguistics, like, that was his deal, like, that was his passion. So. I wonder if they paid him extra for... Doing I don't think so. That. I think they had him in the booth and he was willing to do it. So I almost feel like it's, you get less Scotty because of it. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, yeah, because he was doing everyone else. I mean, uh -huh. but there were multiple times where two characters that weren't Scotty talking to each other were both James Doohan. And he, I went back and forth with being impressed over, so I guess I'm impressed with what he did vocally. But he did so many in these short episodes and not a lot of them that right. you hear him in a lot of the characters too. Like, it probably would have benefited the show a little bit if he didn't do as many. Well... I disagree, but okay. I, I would have, have enjoyed the show a little tiny bit more, I think. I don't have feelings about that. I will say that as much as I love Nichelle Nichols, all of her voices sounded like Nichelle Nichols. Okay, sure. Grow. Well, I mean, uh, in a, most of these filmations, like, you could tell they use like, four actors in there for, like, 20 different characters. Right. So. Well, I think Majel and James were... Jimmy were more accustomed to doing voice whereas right. mm -hmm. I think again it was probably a, she was in the booth and willing to do it but she's just sounded like her. Mm -hmm. I could see that. I mean I guess I'd see it more from the perspective of crafty character of Lisa Simpson's voice actress. Yardley is, Smith? Thank you. I see it as a Yardley Smith thing where it's just like I appreciate the fact that she tried to even when she had even though she has such a distinct sounding voice as Uhura, she tried to do other characters, and yes, it does sound a little bit like the other. It sounds like her, so you knew it was her. I still appreciate the fact that they used her, and they wanted to get, whether by necessity or because she was willing to be there, it was just cool to me that they did that for the three of them. And I just want to give them a shout out, two of them being, well, one of them, two, no, two of them being passed on. <laughs> so it's Michelle's uh, alive, my Jim yeah. and Jimmy mm -hmm. do hang another day. I don't know. I just thought it was really cool that their voice work was, in my opinion, some of the best of the series. I wonder if there was any weird kind of controversy because she did voice a couple of like Caucasian characters, Michelle, and this is the seventies. I wonder if that was. If there's any thought into that at there all? There probably then, wasn't enough scrutiny no. to bring that up. That could be. Yeah. Anything else you want to say? I think we covered it. All right. Well, since we covered it, what I have to do now is thank Michael, Kyle, Nick, and Sarah from the bunker where Junior Podcaster Jack is for joining me to talk about Star Trek, the animated series. And because we've talked about the animated series, it's now time to roll the not-so-cheesy, not-70s credits. Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation Point was produced by Back Pocket Productions, run by yours truly, the Chief Couch Potato, which is really another way of saying executively produced by me, Kylie Piet. My associate producers are Krista Pennington and Celine Resmer. I edit this podcast, and our logo is by Rebecca Wallace. Our marketing graphic artist is Krista. Our theme song was written by Sarah Milbratz and sung by Sarah, Amy McDaniel, and Kelsey Resmer. Kelsey played the keyboard, Ian McDonough played the bass, Christian Somerville played the guitar, and the whole kit and caboodle was engineered and produced by Kyle Aspinall and Christian. We hail from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Please, if you like what you hear, take the time to rate us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. Give us stars, give us comments, give us reviews. Let us know how we're doing. Send us a message. We might just read it on the podcast. 
Tell us what you like, what you don't like, what we should keep, what we should toss. You know how it goes. And if you have suggestions on shows we might consider, contact us at our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, where we have a guest book, via email at couchpotatoesunitepodcast at gmail.com, or via our social media, Facebook, Twitter at CPU Podcast, and Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite. Though, of course, we add new and old shows to chat about around the water cooler all the time. We always have several more new episodes coming down the pike. Just listen to our intros. And if you miss old episodes or want to know in general what we cover, just find us. We are everywhere and searchable wherever you look for things on the internet. You can search for us or you can subscribe at our website, our channels, our social media accounts. Stay up on our new events and episodes. Until the next time, all the Trek series of the past, with the exception of Discovery and soon to be the animated series, are available on just about every streamer you can think of, so we're not going to give preference unless one of them chooses to sponsor us. Hint, double hint. In the meantime, our Star Trek 50 Plus panel will next reconvene to discuss the first season of The Next Generation and part five of this Looking Back series, and that will be very shortly. So until next time, until next episode, new episodes are published every Wednesday. Keep listening, keep watching, stay tuned! Bye-bye! Bye-bye!